Uh, and just quickly recap where we were yesterday, and uh, we are hoping by the end of by today's class we, we can cover a comprehensive example to show how we can design centrifuges. So let's just recap where we where we ended up yesterday. We were looking at the pattern for the, the trajectory, I should say, that a particle will follow when it enters the centrifuge. So we, we said it comes in here at the bottom, and immediately the solid liquid suspension is is flung out to the extremes of the vessel, and it's going to encounter this vertical wall of water or, or liquid. So that particle is going to start its trajectory pretty much on this bottom corner over here, and follow a <coughs> curved path. And it's curved because the force experienced by that particle, the centrifugal force experienced by the particle, varies as a function of its radial position. So the further that particle moves from the center line, the greater the force experienced. So that particle will start to move faster and faster as it gets further and further out. There's also a vertical component to the velocity, and that's due to the simple fact that we're feeding new material, new liquid and solid in here on a continual basis. So that new material is coming in and forcing the material up. So the vertical component is simply due to the fluid flow entering and replacement of that fluid. The horizontal component in the velocity vector there is due to the centrifugal force. Are we going gravity or is there a threshold? Okay, so yesterday's example we showed that gravity here, um, this system that we're dealing with, a very mild system, we're working on forces that are 6,000 times gravity. So a single gravitational force of 1g is going to be negligible compared to the other 6,100 taking place in the system. So we'll see this with cyclones. You can, you can appreciate that this system, you can operate at any angle. You can put it upside down, you can put it on its side, and it will still keep going. A single gravitational force of one lowercase g is going to have no effect relative to the capital G of 6,000 g's being experienced by the system. So gravitational force is totally negligible, relatively speaking. Yesterday's class, we were looking then at this derivation of this formula T star, which is the time it takes for that particle to reach a certain location. And star, the subscript star, refers to the fact that we want to go from R1 to R2, and it's the time taken to travel this vertical distance H. So total time taken for the particle's arc to follow exactly that profile I've shown here today. That's time t star. And that's the time for a given particle of diameter dp with density p, rho p, in a fluid rho f, operating at angular velocity omega in a system where r1 and r2 are given by that value with a fluid viscosity mu f. So very specific on the fluid environment as well as the equipment r1 and r2 and the equipment's operation omega. <coughs> Very clear here. The increase omega, increase that angular velocity, the time taken is much, much shorter because that, ang that force experience, the centrifugal force experienced by the particle, much greater. In fact, this is really a powerful result of the fact that that's omega squared. Small changes or small increases in that rotational speed of the device lead to really rapid reductions. Okay, so that we're going to find that that's a, a very sensitive parameter to, to work with, and it works to our advantage. So that's the particle's trajectory, and we said that any particle that has a trajectory that lies to the right of this, so in other words, a particle that follows, say, this arc, we're hypothetically assuming that that particle actually goes and gets washed out with the fluid that's leaving at the discharge. So, we're saying that this particle would actually not really make it there, it would just get washed out and be thrown out with the supernatants. That's clearly a, a very conservative judgment. So we relaxed that then yesterday and came up with another formula, Q cut, which is the time taken, T cut and the volume, corresponding volumetric flow rate, Q cut, for that particle not to reach there, but rather let's go just to the midpoint. So 50% of the way along that distance, We'll call that Q cut. So that's going to be give us the ability to work at higher Q flooring. So Q cut is going to exceed Q star. 
because t cut is going to be a smaller value. So, so we're, we're saying we don't need to operate so, so conservatively. Let's operate, we consider 50% our cut point. So particles that land up this side are assumed to still be retained. Particles that land up to the right of, of this uh, cut point are assumed to actually wash up. It's a, it's a, a less dramatic or less um, strong assumption. So the example we ended off with yesterday is we, we solved the first part in the class. How many genes is that particle experiencing? And they had a value of 6,000. Now we're going to look at the next part, and we're going to first plan our strategy before we go ahead. Okay. So yesterday uh, we had the G formula up. <coughs> G is the ratio between the acceleration that the particle experiences multiplied by its mass, which is R omega squared, relative to what that particle would experience in a single rig regular gravitational environment. So the ends cross out, and then it's R omega squared. So the radius um, I assumed was the worst case radius, which is the outer edge. So it's the 22.2 times 10 to the minus 3 meters multiplied by 5026, which is omega squared, divided by 9.8. Does that get me <coughs> 57 pounds. Okay. I think what I did, and I often I may have forgotten to square. So it's still, okay, so it's even more dramatic than what we were saying. It's experiencing 57 thousand. So notice I chose the, the worst R. I want to find out what is the particle experiencing when it gets to R2. So that gravitational force, if I used R1, I would have got a, a lower number because R1 is 16.5 millimeters. Um, it's still a substantial number of genes experienced on the side of that R1. It just gets stronger and stronger as it progresses. Did anyone have a chance to calculate Q star or Q cut? And just throw out an order of magnitude number. Okay, so let's take a look at that. What, what is the flow rate we can treat? This is a, a realistic case where someone has a whole back, a bunch of fermentation broth from their lab experiment. They're asking, well, how, how long is it going to take me to treat this? And let's say I've got, a, I've got 50 liters of lab uh, fermentation broth to deal with. What is the flow rate Q that I can work with? And in other words, how long is it going to take me to filter this, this experiment? So, the strategy we follow is very straightforward. We have this, straight, this formula Q that we derived yesterday. V is the volume occupied in the centrifuge divided by T. And we can choose to either use T star or T cut. Depending on which one I use, I'll get the corresponding Q star or Q cut. So, so what, what we can do is, let's say this side of the class, this, this side works for Q star, this side calculates uh, Q cut. And let's just compare our answers. So go ahead and calculate what those Q star and Q cut values would be. And, and report them in liters per hour.
Straightforward application. Notice I'm just breaking it up into two parts. We'll see why in a minute. Uh, this first term over here is when you sub in, you get 0 0.0206. Multiplied by the, the inverse of that log ratio gets you 3.37. And that final term is the volume term V, and that works out to be um, 7.9 times 10 to 5 by minus 5. And so the product of those three which are Q star of point zero point zero six uh oh, sorry. Okay. I have a good question. <coughs> Go for it. Um Q star is V over T star, right? Yeah. And the product for T star that we have doesn't have the last term to the right. So this is it's over, it's in over okay, there. Okay. So for this system, you would be able to work at uh, 20 meters per day with, with your capacity on this thing. If you're using Q star as your measure. Yeah. It's the volume of the fluid, right? This uh, term over here is V. Yeah. And also, are we always going to assume that it's like a completely straight line? Well, yeah, it's operating so fast that yeah. we saw yesterday's video. Uh, once you got to a thousand RPM, you're already at another cobalt, so it's, it's very reasonable assumption. Okay, so Q cut is no different to this formula. The only thing with Q cut is you're replacing this long over here with a slightly different term. So this first term is the same, the last term is the same, it's just that middle one that's a little bit different. So that's why I've broken it out that way. Um, so Q cut I'll simply write up here as 0.0206. Again, the difference is that if you use the different log, log ratio and then you get 7.27 this time, multiplied by the same other part, 7.9 times 10 to the minus 5. And that gets you an answer of 1.9 <coughs> times 10 to the minus 5. So Meters cubed per second, which corresponds to 42.8 meters per hour. Okay, so Q cut is, is, is higher than Q star, that's to be expected because it makes less conservative assumptions, showing we can treat probably around 43 meters of this graph in an hour. Okay, now the next question is, was Stokes law valid to use? So before we go ahead and, and calculate that, what is what is what do we need to do if we want to check that assumption? How can we verify it? Yeah. Uh, check the Reynolds number to see if it's less than one. Okay, so check Reynolds numbers less than one. What terms do we need for the Reynolds number? What values? Velocity, which velocity? Is it relative velocity? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Uh, the particle. Okay, so what's the velocity of the particle? Yeah. It would be the place of time it takes to get from like the full height and it takes to travel the full height. Okay, so we, we simply just want to check the Stokes law applies. So what we can do is we know the velocity of the particle is changing in the system. So if we check simply the point in time where the particle is moving at its fastest, then we're guaranteed that, every, that the rest of the time Stokes law applies. So velocity of the particle is what we need. We want it at the worst case scenario. 
and then we can just plug into Reynolds number and calculate. So what the point in time where the particle is moving at its fastest? Right at the top of the centrifuge. So that velocity then is what we'll call VTSV, the terminal setting velocity when it's operating under centrifugal force and given by dp squared times the density difference rho p minus rho f multiplied by r omega squared divided by 18 mf. So that's from Stokes law, assuming that, that Reynolds number is less than 1, we're going to check that velocity and then plug it in and see if Reynolds is actually less than 1. Question, we, we know dp, we know rho p, we know rho f, we know omega, what r do we use? R2. R2, so that's the worst case uh, velocity, r2. And if you sum in that and calculate uh, that number, you would find 4.57 times 10 to the minus 4 meters per second, which corresponds to about half a millimeter per second of that particle. So less than half a millimeter per second is that rate of velocity of the particle. No surprise then that, uh, that Stokes law definitely applies. In this case, the Reynolds number at that condition is equal to 0 0.0003. Okay, so at its fastest point, Reynolds number is such a small value, definitely Stokes law applies. So our prior derivations make sense. Yeah. So that's the uh, horizontal velocity. Yeah. So, then, does it have the vertical? so the vertical velocity that drag. Yeah. So we can certainly calculate. So we calculate that volume, <coughs> and then calculate the velocity of that particle. I'm sure. I haven't checked it, but I'm sure that, that the vertical velocity will be slower still. Okay. Yeah. We can double check that. Yeah. Pretty good exercise. It doesn't really matter because it's not going. So yeah, okay. So actually, yeah, that's a good point. I appreciate that. So the vertical component, as Brian pointed out here, is simply just being carried with the fluid. There's no relative. The particle's not moving in the vertical direction. So it's, it's in the horizontal direction that it's being flung. Out and there's centrifugal force, and that's the velocity. Yeah, great. Thanks. Okay. So. Final question then, which will lead into the next part of this notes. What is the area of a sedimentation vessel that you could build operating at that Q-cut? So this Q-cut over here, 1.19 to the minus 5. If that was the desired flow rate, what would be the required area of a gravitational settling, uh, sedimentation vessel to achieve the same separation? Firstly, what do we expect that area to be? Huge. Okay, so go ahead and and what don't, don't do the calculation. Simply plan how you're going to calculate that VTSV. What's going to go into there? Same formula over there, except using r omega squared, you sit, replace that with g, the gravitational constant. So dp squared with density difference times g divided by 18 u. That velocity is 8 times 10 to the minus 9 meters per second. 
So if you compare that velocity to the gravitational velocity, there's a difference of about 56,000. So this particle in the centrifuge is moving 56,000 times faster than under gravity. If you just ratio those two velocities, you'll see that the order of magnitude is faster in the, in the centrifuge. So that's giving you an idea of the scale up here. But then what will really help put it in perspective is when you recognize that the ratio of the areas, uh, sorry, when you plug in there and calculate the area, we would need a vessel of 1,500 meters squared. That would come out to something where the diameter is about 43.5 meters. Okay, so that's a lot, like almost double the size of this room is the diameter of the sedimentation vessel, just to achieve the same sort of separation. If you were relying on gravity alone to do it. For you. So that's definitely unmanageable, um, especially when we're dealing with aseptic material like fermentation blocks, we want that in a closed environment. We cannot rely on sedimentation of any sort to do this for us. So we're getting a tremendous scale up by doing this in a centrifuge. That's the key, key result there. Any questions on this example? Okay, what I'd like to consider next then is uh, some of the theory behind centrifuges and how we can transfer our results from one centrifuge to another. So here's, here's a, a very interesting approach to it. It's called the Sigma theory for centrifuges. And by taking those formulas that we had up there earlier for Q-cut, if you multiply the numerator and the denominator by G, not, not two G, you may have that in your notes, it's a, just a single G, um, and then use that relationship there for Stokes' law, you'll find that that equation simplifies. Uh, so using that, that's Stokes' law for gravitational. So that term matches exactly that. The remainder of the formula is a big mess of numbers. And we just call that sigma. And sigma comes out to be, for this case, that equation over there. So it's, it's an interesting equation. It has units of meters squared. Okay, so let's just, uh, just check the dimensions there on that equation. Q has units of meters cubed per second. And then this term over here, that's the terminal settling velocity under gravity. That has units of meters per second. So then sigma then must have units of meters squared to make that uh, consistent. And in fact, it does hold if you look at the units of this, this formula over here, you get meters squared. The other interesting thing about that formula is it's only a function of the centrifuge itself and how you choose to operate it. It's not a function at all of the type of material I'm putting into it. So at no point do I need the density of the particles or the fluid in that formula. It's only a function of the, the geometry, R1 and R2. So how, once I've bought my centrifuge, I, I know what R2 is. Once I configure my centrifuge, I know what R1 is. I know the height of it. And omega is my other operational parameter that I choose. So I choose to run it at a certain rotation speed. And once I know those, I know sigma. What's, what's neat about that then is that I can use that to compare uh, centrifuges and I can also use it to scale up within the same centrifuge. So let's take that formula for one centrifuge, centrifuge A. The Q-cut, the volumetric flow rate I can achieve in that first centrifuge is a product of the gravitational, uh, the terminal setting of the last gravity multiplied by sigma A. And then I pre repeat that for a second centrifuge. Because B is the same terminal settling velocity multiplied by sigma B. So same feed, same type of material. So let's say an oil sands mixture or milk, if you're trying to separate the cream from the milk, or the same broth, fermentation broth from your lab experiment. So same feed in, in, is being considered here. And so VTSV due to gravity is the same number for the same feed. And if I ratio those two formulas, I get what's, what's here in the middle of the slide. And this is the key result. Because it says that 
a centrifuge under one set of conditions, A, so sigma A, so a centrifuge with a certain radius R1, R2, height, and omega in centrifuge A. And let's say I know that because it's, it's easy to calculate. And then I, I run my, my feed through that and I get a corresponding <coughs> flow rate Q cut. If I operate centrifuge B under different conditions, but I know what they are, omega, height, R1, R2 from centrifuge B. So I can calculate sigma A, I can calculate sigma B. I know what Q cut A is from my first experiment. I can calculate what it's going to be in that other centrifuge B. I can predict without having to do any experiments what I'm going to get from that second centrifuge. So it can be used for scale up on the same feed. In fact, we use, you can use this on one so even sigma A and sigma B can actually refer to the same physical centrifuge, just operated with different omegas. That's another way to use the formula. Um, another way to use it is to take this formula, sigma A, can be applied to one tubular ball centrifuge, and sigma B can be due to a second tubular ball centrifuge. Same feed, and I can then scale up and, and scale down. I can also use it in the following really interesting way, and this is how it's, mo it's, it's commonly done. If I know sigma A for a given centrifuge and for a given feed, I can calculate the performance for a different feed stream. Okay, so for a different feed, I can predict what that uh, centrifuge is going to be. So the data from one experiment can be used to predict the results from another experiment. So this is very common in companies. Capital equipment like centrifuge costs a lot to install and get operating. So once it's up and running and working on one feed, there may come a time a year or two later where they need to start using it for, for, to process another stream. So how can they predict that centrifuge's performance on the new, new type of feed? And then this form is, is really powerful. For that. Okay, so, so we'll come, come and use that as an example later on. I just also want to end off the section on tubular ball centrifuges by looking at the case where we can separate two liquids of different density. So back to the principle that's being used here. The principle is separation due to density differences, not due to particle size. So if I feed material here of mixed, mixed uh, density, so one, one liquid of, of a higher density and a liquid of a lower density, what will happen is that the heavier liquid will be thrown out further so the heavier liquid with rho h. And if I engineer that, that, that horizontal portion over there, normally ran all the way across in the previous diagrams, this time if I engineer it to have, to have an opening, I can draw off my heavier liquid and I can draw off my lighter liquid in two separate streams. So coming back to the oil sands example, oil sands, for those of you that are familiar with it, the, you're mixing hot water in with your oil, so you've got oil and water mixtures. You actually also have a third phase, you've got solid sand as well, um, which I'll, I'll show how that, the principle of that in a minute, but just oil and water, two, two different phases can be separated quite easily in a, in a tubular hole centrifuge. So those videos that I showed you yesterday, those are these home videos of people that do exactly that. They try to make their own biodiesel at home and separate waste streams uh, to, to then use as fuel. So very easy to do in a, in a tubular ball centrifuge. Okay, so now let's look at something a little different. Let's look at a different uh, centrifuge where we try to take away the, the fact and the disadvantage of this prior centrifuge, uh, the tubular ball centrifuge, is that we have to clean it out. So it's a batch, it's a, I skipped over this, but it's up here. It's batch-wise operated. So once the solids build up on the wall, after a period of time I have to stop clean it out, restart. Um, and that process can lead to contamination. So what, the, what we try to do is let's see if we can get these centrifuges to operate on a continuous basis and continually remove the solids. So the way that that's done is this single sealed unit um, is used. And rather than trying to explain all these flow patterns, no surprise that the companies that make these things have nice little videos to try and explain how they work. So let's take a look at that. <coughs> so 
there's no sound on this one, it's just titles. So the, print, the, main, the main advantage of this guy relative to the prior one is clearly the continuous operation. So the solids get discharged periodically out the sides over there. The other real innovative idea here is these diagonal plates. So what happens is in the previous centrifuge we showed, we only had the outer wall to catch the solids. Okay? What happens here, like with 50 to about 150 diagonal plates now, is you're giving an opportunity for the solids to encounter this diagonal surface much more frequently and be retained and pulled out to the side. Okay, so that essentially you've increased the surface area inside the centrifuge by a very, very high factor, allowing the solids to be caught and then retained and, and then let out. So that increased surface area then is, is the key, the key selling factor of these centrifuges. So angled discs give a greater surface area. We can then really ramp up the volume of solids and liquids fed to the to the centrifuge. So Q on this type of centrifuge, the disc ball centrifuge, is much much greater than on just a tube of the ball. It also has the advantage that because it's closed up, it's aseptic. So it's, you'll see anyone who works in the biofield will see these all the time. Um, and they're used for clarifying various types of foods and beverages, fruit <coughs> juices, oils, and, um, and, and three phase mixtures as well. I'll show you in a minute how that, how that works. So here's the, here's the equations for it. We, we don't try to derive the terminal settling velocity uh, in this class for this. It's a messy formula. Someone's done all the work and there it's summed up for us in the sigma value. So we use that sigma for this centrifuge 
in exactly the same way as we do for the pi one. So Q is equal to sigma times E, the settling velocity under gravity. So we, all we do is we calculate our gravitational settling velocity, calculate sigma, and then we can calculate Q. Uh, but the sigma for this centrifuge is now a function of the geometry again, R1 and R2, raised to the cube power and the number of plates that we have. So that's a number that varies between 50 to 150 disks is the number of plates. The angle of the disk is theta, a number between 50 and sorry, 35 and 50 degrees. Uh, G shows up in there as well as omega squared as well. So gain to the power of omega squared as before. Okay, so a different sigma. Now one thing you cannot do is use the sigma from a tubular ball centrifuge in that, uh, remember we had that formula for the ratio of, of two sigmas. So that formula back here you cannot use sigma from a tubular ball centrifuge and sigma from a disc ball centrifuge and, and try to scale up. There are two very different types of, of principles. So that, uh, that stated over here, sigma equation is different for other centrifuge types. You cannot scale up from one type of centrifuge to a different type. So within the same type, that's a, that's a valid equation to use, but not between the types of centrifuges. Okay, any questions so far on that uh, principle of operation? Cool. So let's uh, take a look then at uh, two other types of centrifuges that one I like to encounter. So these are called scroll centrifuges because internal to that now they have a scroll conveyor which rotates at a slower speed than the centrifuge itself. And the purpose of the scroll is to aid removal of the solids in a continual basis. So think back to the tubular ball centrifuge where you have the vertical walls of water. And now simply have a scroll to remove those solids away from the wall. Okay, and here, these centrifuges are typically operated on their side. So it, as I mentioned before, it doesn't matter the orientation of these units. So take that tubular ball centrifuge we saw before with the two vertical walls of water, rotate it 90 degrees, add a scroll into it, and use that scroll to remove your solids. And so that allows you to take that thing to continuous operation and because it's all sealed up, it is widely used in biotech applications as well. Another interesting one here is this, for, it's used for plastics recycling. So let's just take a look at, uh, at this diagram and understand the flow here. So here's my feed coming in with mixed solids and liquid, and it's, it's allowed to be um, released there in the center point. Particles with large diameter, they get thrown to the edge really fast. So a large diameter particle will get thrown to the edge really quickly, much faster than a smaller particle that is. And this scroll will rotate in this direction to remove those larger solids. The particles that are smaller they won't reach the wall rapidly. They, take, they spend longer time in the liquid before they reach the wall. And because the fluid is being fed in over there and fluid is being withdrawn out here on the side and over here, those smaller particles remain in suspension and will start to travel in this direction back again and will follow that sort of arc shape and land up against the wall over here. So smaller particles will be retained and come out on this side of the centrifuge, larger particles will then leave them out on the opposite end. So this is the so-called sortie cancer because it's doing separations by particle size of the type of sorting as well as, as removing the liquid from the solid. So it's doing uh, two things at once. These are also the types of centrifuges you'll encounter in the oil sands applications. So let's take a look at that uh, those oil sands applications. Here's a uh, uh, we saw the video we were just watching was from this vendor, Westphalia. They're a common uh, vendor for centrifugal equipment in all industries, pharmaceutical, oil sands, and, and biotech. You'll find their, their name everywhere, pretty much. So they've got this little flow sheet here showing how centrifuges are used in the oil sands. So here's my hot water being used to treat the oil sands as a froth flotation step. Uh, so that's also a separator. 
But what we're dealing with then is the, the, the flow here where there's a there's bitumen, there's water, there's clay. So there's there's two phases, oil and water, and then there's solids clay. Scroll centrifuge used over here to set to do a preliminary separation. Those finer tailings will come down here. The bitumen oil mixture with solids still retained over there. So this is a primarily watery mixture with a bit of, of um, solids in it, so mostly water. This stream here is mostly a oil phase with solids still in it. This full centrifuge separating again, three streams leaving. There's your dilute bitumen now with much, much less solids in it. There's the heavier phase, oil, oil, water, and then this phase coming down here is water, primarily water. So that primarily water with very fine tailings is, is coming in here. Another separator, another centrifuge to take out just the final amounts of solids. That water then gets recycled, so it's, it's mostly in a closed loop. Uh, you get to reuse your water, heat it up again, and send it back around another time. Okay. Then this oily mixture here, bitumen now with, without the solids, that goes to the upgrades. Okay. Anyone worked in a well center and seen some of these centrifuges? A yeah, few hands, a uh, couple of people. Seen these, I've, uh, some of you have come and spoken to me about it. So these are, these are very common in, in that industry. So a scroll centrifuge and then a scroll centrifuge. So what I'll do is I'll talk a bit about safety and then we'll show how one can design these centrifuges. Just a, a, the reason why I talk about safety is there's some things that are not always obviously apparent here with these centrifuges. They're obviously rotating at very high speeds. That's one critical safety issue. But some other uh, points come to mind. Because they're rotating at such high speeds, there's a lot of heat around the system. So if you're dealing with bio materials, that heat uh, will destroy many sensitive organisms. And so many of these units come with integrated refrigeration to make sure that heat's removed fast. Um, because you're rotating very rapidly, you need very careful balance. Um, you don't want anything getting off center. Materials of construction are phenomenally important. You'll notice that these centrifuges tend to be much, much longer than they are in, than they, they are in diameter. So very narrow diameters much, much longer. The reason for that is simply because of that centrifugal force is a function of radial distance. The, lot, the, the greater the diameter of your centrifugal force, not only is your particle experiencing greater forces, but the centrifugal vessel itself, those retaining walls, are also experiencing those same forces. Um, and the equipment, the material of construction, uh, needs to be able to withstand those, that, that tangential forces. So very often you'll see the equipment is more long rather than uh, wider in diameter for that reason. So there's an upper bound in the diameter, essentially. Very careful digital control required in these systems. Um, and then for systems, especially oil sands, this is a, a, an issue, is dealing with flammable fluids in a closed, pressurized environment. Um, they're operated with, with nitrogen blankets to prevent those problems from that. OK, so how, how does one select now between these various centrifuges? is fairly, fairly straightforward. There's two there's these two tables I'll show you. One is to look based on particle size. Uh, so what is the particle diameter range that you're dealing with? Okay, so depending on, on that, that range of particles, so in microns, the smaller particles will go with different technologies. So tubular bowl centrifuges will be considered. We didn't really consider ultra centrifuges, which are for, for much, much smaller particle sizes. Uh, some of those those decanters, the scroll centrifuges we saw, um, are those over there. And then there's several others, right? The, the many many centrifugal technologies one can consider. There's another way one can look at judging which type of centrifuge to use is look at that Q divided by sigma ratio, and for and and plot that relative to your flow rate Q that you need to treat. So Q, the flow rate we need to treat, there's a whole variety of technologies that we can choose over here. But then this is also interesting. It says that if you find yourself in this region, you're better off looking at sedimentation. So get your energy for free. And that 
sedimentation works well for cases where you're dealing with very low flow rates and larger particle sizes. You get a high set, high setting velocities over there. Okay, so Q over sigma, remember, is equal to that setting velocity. So we're going to find ourselves over here for large particle sizes and, and just use sedimentation. But when we when we're beyond this region, this is when we need to start to consider centrifuges and the various types, disc hole, scroll types, um, and then the laboratory centrifuges. So it's just one time zone velocity Yeah, um, yeah, you might please correct this. I, I forgot to omit it. Take the two times, but uh, it came from a textbook that used a different convention to what I've been using. So it's Q over sigma equal to the second velocity. Uh, if you use two times the second velocity, you're not going to be far off because this y-axis is, um, x-axis is such a, a large scale. So uh, that's why I didn't pick up that initially. But you're not going to be much wrong if you use it by mistake. OK, so we don't have too much time for the rest of the class. But what I would like to do is leave this um, problem in your mind to consider over the weekend. And we'll look at this on Monday on Tuesday. This is an actual problem for a beer production company. They're producing 100 meters cubed of beer with yeast suspended in the fluid phase. Those yeast particles are in the order of 46 microns. And that's the percentage weight of yeast suspended. What I'd like to consider is firstly which type of centrifuge to use. Okay, the answer is quite straightforward based on the requirements here. But then the next thing I want you to do is you, you can go ahead and do the calculations if you wish, but far more importantly, I would like you to just think about how you're going to do these calculations. If you think about those formulas for sigma, there's a lot of parameters in there. How are you going to solve this problem? Okay, we've got R's to pick, omegas to pick, which flow rate Q do you use, how long does the centrifuge operate every day. So what I'm more interested here is just on the approach to solve. This is an actual problem. Um, and how do you end up specifying this?